Welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, where we celebrate the craft of poetry. Each week, we feature interviews with incredible poets and artists, including Olivia Gatwood and A.E. Stallings, and original poetry read by the authors. I'm your host, James Moorhead, poet laureate of Dublin, California, and author of Canvas and Portraits of Red and Gray. A veteran of over 30 years as pianist and conductor at the renowned Lyric Opera of Chicago, Philip Moorhead has extensive experience in the operatic repertory. He has conducted a widely varied list of concert works and contemporary music and performed in as varied a repertory of chamber music. A consummate musician, he has coached singers in operatic and concert repertory and given master classes in vocal and chamber music interpretation and performance. In addition to his musical activities, Mr. Moorhead is the editor of revised editions of the New American Rajay's College Thesaurus, the New American Webster's Handy College Dictionary, and Hoyle's Rules of Games. He is author of the New International Dictionary of Music and the Penguin Thesaurus. Philip Moorhead is also my dad. Dad, welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast. Thank you. Let's start with a definition, appropriately. Define lexicographer, and is it more appropriate to say a dictionary is written or is a dictionary edited? Uh, well, the brief definition of lexicographer, I guess, is is someone who writes dictionaries or edits dictionaries or or compiles dictionaries. Uh, there are all sorts of ways of putting that. Um, but basically, it's someone who, who produces a lexicon, which is sort of where the word comes from. And uh, uh, there are all sorts of ways of doing that. Well, I guess we'll get to that later. Uh, so, so the simple answer is somebody who writes who writes dictionaries, and that's. And in my case, it's more like someone who edits dictionaries because, generally speaking, I was working with with an already existing, uh, uh, you know, publication, and then refining it and editing and updating it. Well, I remember growing up that you had a filing cabinet filled with definitions pre widespread home computers and one or at least I as I remember one definition for index card what are your earliest memories from watching your father work on the dictionary um yeah the the uh, it, it's true that in 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 the earlier days the, the, it pretty much it was one definition per card um maybe with with associated words included on that card different parts of speech that relate to the to the main word um, we used to have, uh, my, my father had it is in their, their last uh, apartment in New York. They had special safes that were constructed to hold uh, trays of index cards. Mm-hmm. And although this, this wasn't, this wasn't for the dictionaries, the dictionaries were already at this point, were already in print and, and, and continuing, but they were for the foreign language dictionaries that my father got into a, a big project to produce in, in his later years. Um, and in fact, uh, you were talking about when my, my earliest memories, I, I didn't really watch my father working on this this stuff, but my first job was with him or in his office. And I was working for a colleague of his who was a, a German uh, nobleman named Count Waldemar von Zedwitz. And he was a, 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 a rich old fellow who loved words. He loved working with, with words, and particularly with the origins of words, or what we call etymologies. And my first job, which was very instructive, was to take a, an index card which had on it the etymology or the, the, the word, or the origin of a particular word, and to copy the corrections that were on that card to another card, which was the, identical to the first one, except without the corrections. And uh, I discovered that it's even in doing something as incredibly simple as that, you can make it, 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 innumerable mistakes. Mm. And, and they would go over my, my, my transferring of these editings from one card to another and point out the usually a dozen or more ways in which I had screwed it up in the process of doing this, what would seem like an absolutely uh, effortless and, and, and errorless task. 
It was, it was very instructive, the first job. So I, uh, you know, I, that was the first thing I really did that was connected with the, the dictionary editing. And that was for a, a large multi-volume dictionary, which my father was in the process of trying to produce, which actually never never got produced. It was it was a contract for Simon and Schuster, and it it uh, it just it never happened. But they worked for years on these on these on these etymologies, and uh, it, was, it was quite instructive. Well, that, that kind of leads into the next question, which is that creating a dictionary requires an extraordinary attention to detail. Did your love of words come out of working on dictionaries, or did you acquire a love of words from being immersed in so many definitions? I, I think my love of words came from growing up where I, uh, in the household that I grew up in, because my, my parents, both my father and my mother, were totally immersed in the in 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 words i mean they they every word was a subject of conversation mm -hmm. every word was a was a uh, <clears throat> was something to play with and we, we he seldom used a word normally i mean you'd always fool around with it because using it normally was much too boring so but this was this was my upbringing so i i, I lived with this for my entire young life and uh, and it was somewhat daunting because uh, my father was a remarkable person and, uh, and an incredible editor. And when I was graduating from high school, I was the editor of my of my high school uh, yearbook. And we had pretty much finished most of the work on it, but I had the page proofs for it when I came home from a, for a, for a break. And uh, of course, I showed it to my father, and, and out came the red pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and this had all been this had all been proofread, you know, by everybody. And out came the red pencil, correcting innumerable things in this in this, in this already thoroughly corrected uh, manuscript. It was like, again very very instructive. Um, I, I your your mention of detail. I had two things written down because you, you, uh, the one thing about dictionaries is that they're, they're, they have an, in, an endless supply of places to make mistakes and for there to be typo, typos and for there to be misprints. And uh, two short uh, little, uh, little uh, stories about, about this situation. When I, we were doing a, a, a new edition of, I forgot what it was, the Dictionary of the Thesaurus, um, I got the box of the newly printed, beautifully printed uh, books from, from Penguin. And I opened the box most with great excitement and picked up the first book, opened it, and the first thing I saw was a misprint. And I was so furious about it that I slammed the book shut. And I still have no idea where it was. I mean, this misprint is still, I'm sure, in in these in this whatever this book was, whatever the thesaurus or the dictionary was, I'm sure it never got corrected, and and because I could never find it again. And the other thing was was my uh, your, your sister Karen's story about a revision we did of, the, of one of the revisions of the of the of the dictionary, the Handy College Dictionary. Of uh, the cover, we decided for space reasons, in order to put in a lot more words, we to take out the illustrations, which we thought were 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 kind of superfluous and not very helpful anyway. Well, nobody, the, the people that do the cover, of course, are totally separate. It's like, it's like newspaper, you know, the, the headlines are written by people that have nothing to do with writing the story at all. They just look through, look for things to make, and they write headlines. So whoever does the cover is, is in a similar situation. And they had on the cover a, a carryover from the previous edition was the, the only illustrated dictionary in its class. Well, it was the only illustrated dictionary in its class with no illustrations. And... <laughs> We, she discovered this at the point where there were like a hundred thousand copies of this thing had been printed, and uh, I did. Of course, I told the publisher about it, and they corrected it for the next edition. But there was, but there are there are a hundred thousand copies of this thing out somewhere that are unillustrated, vaunting the fact that they were illustrated. <laughs> Well, it's the only one in its class, so you could... The you only could, one in its class. Yeah, no, there you go. So I think it kind of meets the... It's an unusual way to say it's the only one in its class. <laughs> That's terrific. So uh, people don't realize that there are many dictionaries, and each serves a specific purpose. Your library includes many different dictionaries. Fascinating to look through. 
For the Handy College Dictionary, how did you and your father approach the choices about which words to include and how to write uh, or edit the definitions? Well, I, I can't speak for my father because the, 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 the putting together of these dictionaries happened in the late 40s. And uh, so this, the, the, the basic decision for the whole, for the, the, the whole dictionary had long, long ago been made. But when I, when I did revisions of them, I did have to make decisions on what to add. And as you say, whether to delete anything from it. And although we, we very rarely deleted anything, I mean, I took a word out. Uh, because these, these are small dictionaries, pretty much everything in them is, is standard. It's, it's nothing unusual, really, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in them. So that's not their purpose. So, uh, you know, there's nothing much that's, that's deletable. It's all very standard English and, and uh, common words and one uses pretty much every day. Um, but for adding words, uh, it's you, you know there's no there's no great answer to that. I mean, you 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 make a decision based on your own experience and what's what seems important to you in your in your, your use of language. You do compare with, or we did compare with with our with our comp competitive, you know, similar size dictionaries, and we did make word list comparisons between them to make sure that we weren't leaving out something obvious that 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 should have been there but beyond that um you know pretty much it's 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 your own your own feelings about the language and what you think is, is important and so it's going to be different for each 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 mm -hmm. different dictionary because they're the editors have different different backgrounds and different different tastes so when i was interviewing the uh the copy editor of both of my 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 first book and my upcoming book uh phenomenal copy editor she talked about the resources that she uses to do the awesome job that she does what what are some of the resources that you used when working on revisions of the dictionary well because one of the considerations was to avoid using dictionaries that we were competing with similar size dictionaries in order to avoid uh, you know any possible accidental plagiarism because it's 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 easy. The thing about you know definitions is that is that you're all trying to say the same thing, but not quite the same way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's important to stay away from books that you could be accused of being of, of plagiarizing. So uh, generally speaking, I use books that were not competitive. I mean, they were much bigger and not in the same really in the same category, such as the, the absolute standard for all people, which is the Oxford English Dictionary in whatever, in its various formats. Uh, the, the United uh, the North American equivalent of that, the closest equivalent, which is the Merriam-Webster and New International Dictionary. And the, uh, for a long, long time, the second edition of the, of the New International on the British Dictionary was kind of the standard on, on this side of the, of the pond. Uh, and then the third edition came out, and the third edition had a lot of 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 things in it that were controversial. Mm -hmm. For instance, I, th I think I think one of the big things was that "ain't" was not listed as colloquial or slang or any any or non or substandard. They decided to take out a lot of those kinds of of, of judgment calls. Mm -hmm. And that caused a tremendous amount of 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 of, of, uh, of annoyance in, in in various circles. And the New York Times, for years, would not switch over to the Third International Dictionary. They used the Second International as their basis, and it was mainly because of these because the Third kind of um, you know got rid of these these judgments that a lot of people feel are, are important. You know, eight is eight is not considered standard English. I mean, they may try to say that it's standard English, but it isn't. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not. Those people don't consider it that. So, so I think that's probably by now has has worked its way up. This was many decades ago, but they but for for quite a few years, the second was used by preference by a lot of, uh, of publishers, despite the fact that the third was already out and and in use. Hmm. So th those are the two main that I would say the two main sources for checking things, or for, or, you know. And, and then you do, of course, look at your competitors just to not you know, very carefully, so as not to to in the source of, of writing your definitions or anything, but just so that, just to compare what's out there. Cool. 
So in addition to a dictionary, as, you, as I mentioned in the intro, you also worked on a thesaurus. And for listeners, if you have a paperback thesaurus on your bookshelf with a red cover, it's very likely when you open the cover, you'll see my dad and my grandfather's names listed there. You mentioned to me recently that a thesaurus is somewhat unique to the English language. Share more about that. Well, English, you know, is, is probably, if it isn't the largest language in the world, it's, it's, it's among the very, very largest. And one reason is that it's, it has two very complete sources of, of vocabulary, the Germanic side of things and the Latin side of things. So that in English, at least for every concept, for every whatever, you have two words, at least, one Germanic, one Latin. Uh, and then we borrow from everybody. I mean, there's never been an attempt to really to keep English pure. And my mm -hmm. my father felt very strongly that that the that it should be open to to all sources. So we have, you know, Indian and and uh, I don't I don't know every every possible a source of of a word we are willing to accept. Whereas other for instance, the, the languages like French. The French academies tried very hard to keep the language pure. Well, you can't because people do what, you know, we still are going to get hot dog and things like that that are, you know, has nothing to do with French. But they tried. English, that effort, I don't think, was ever really made. And so the, the language has just grown. So there are a ton of words. And the, the great thing about the thesaurus is that, that and you need a lot of words for, really for a thesaurus of the kind that we have in English which was uh, we usually calls Roger's thesaurus, uh, which is based on the idea of putting all, all words together with the, same, the things that, that, that relate to them. And in the case of Roger's, the original Roger's thesaurus was a, a collection of a thousand categories of like death and taxes and this, that, that you could put every word that relates to that, whether it's a noun, a verb, or an adjective, or whatever, in the same place. And then, within those categories, there are cross-references. Mm -hmm. So you can follow, you know, if, if, if a word in particular would interest you, it may, it may be referring you to another category. Well, my father's thesaurus, the one that I worked on many times, uh, was was a modification of that, and he wasn't the first person to do it. But it was a, it was in effect a synonym dictionary with categories. So you had a list of of words and and their synonyms as a synonym dictionary, which is so basically you're putting only the part of speech that is the same as the word that you're that you're looking up. So if it's a noun, you'll have a bunch of nouns that mean the same thing. In the category you get that noun plus all the words of, of adjectives, verbs of different parts of speech, all that relate to that word in concept. And the, 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 the alphabetical thesaurus combines those two. So you have, a, you have a word list of synonym entries. But within those, there are all sorts of references to categories, which will then bring you together with uh, other words of different parts of speech that relate to that concept and the uh, so the fundamental part about the thesaurus is is cross-referencing is being able to is, is having going from one place to another in the book to find other words that are related to the concept that you're that you're looking up and one, one quick short, a funny story about this about our own thesaurus was that in, in, a, in a later years i think even after i'd stopped doing revisions uh, New American or Penguin decided that it would be good to have an electronic version of this. And they put it on Kindle. Mm -hmm. But they didn't do anything about cross-referencing. So you have a, a book that, you know, that you're supposed to kind of read like a novel, but that's not what a thesaurus is. And I, they got a, the only reason I found out about this is because they got a letter from a reader who said, no, I just bought your your online uh, thesaurus at Kindle. I said, what do I do now? <laughs> because there's no way to go from one, there's no provision made for going from one place to another, which was the, is the fundamental. That's the whole point. Essential yes. characteristic of the thesaurus. Yeah. 
so I had to write back to her and say, I'm sorry, I had nothing to do with this. And it's, and I, I apologize. I will do what I can with the publisher to see if we can do something about this. I'm sure they haven't. So it's probably still that way. Okay. Um, but the thesaurus is a wonderful thing. In most, in most languages, you get synonym dictionaries. And in some cases, you get something more like a thesaurus where you get, again, a combination of parts of speech of, 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 under related concepts. But the, the, the Roger's version, the, the category version, is, I think, the most thorough uh, in, in the world in any language. So what are you? Uh, what are some of the things we, you talked a little about language evolving and the judgment calls you need to make? Um, what are the and that you know you didn't really remove words because of the nature of the dictionary. Uh, but then what are some of the changes in the language? I think with computer technology has introduced a whole bunch of things in the lexicon, either existing words with different meanings, or even brand new words. Uh, where do you think, in your judgment, that a word goes from being colloquial to becoming just part of the language more in, in a more bedrocky sense to the extent any word is bedrocky. That's that's um, it's a judgment call. I mean, whoever whoever is putting together the book is a judgment call. Now, the, the big organizations like Merriam-Webster or Oxford, they have whole departments to deal with this question. Mm -hmm. And and they they are they are questioned a lot by people outside about that, and so they really have to justify their decisions on you know again how you label the word or whether whether it's included and whether you know all these questions of um, at what point does it become does a word become part of the of the accepted canon of of, of the vocabulary. And uh, I think uh, uh, Merriam-Webster and I think Oxford, both of them put out annual lists of new words that they consider having arrived at this point that you're talking about, where the word is now is now part of the general accepted vocabulary. And uh, but again, it's, it's a judgment call. Yeah, yeah. Now, in my case, when I when I was doing uh, updates of the dictionary, I would I would you know based on my own experience would decide. I'd look through all sorts of sources for new words and add it to the, 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 the Oxford and, and Merriam-Webster, for just to mention too, uh, and then decide, given on the basis of space and how much we we wanted to enlarge the book, um, you know what which which words I thought were worthy of being added. It's it's it's, it's purely a, it's an individual yeah. judgment call. Well, I'm going to close after this last question by actually reading a, an, a wonderful Sestina that your father wrote. But before I do that, um, have there been any connections between your work as a lexicographer and your day job as a classical musician? Well, because I was my, my work as a classical musician, largely, at least my, my, my real professional paid work as a classical musician, largely was dealing with, with vocal music, either, either opera or song literature. <clears throat> and of course, in, in, in those fields, a sense of language is critical. For my, for my money, the most important thing about in an opera or, or in a song or anything is the words. First of all, that's what it's all based on. Uh, now, the, the, the music is, is and that's not putting down what the music is, but if the, if the words weren't there, it wouldn't mean anything. So, uh, so my language background uh, is very important and is, is, is a day-to-day -day thing, you know, in, in my, in, in my work up in, in, in at Lyric Opera and so on. It, it was, it was a daily, a, a day of daily use to me. So, uh, very important. It was a short answer. Very important. Cool. Well, thanks very much, dad. And after a short break, we're going to come back and hear a wonderful Sestina that your father wrote, since we are a poetry podcast after all, and words are at the core. So thanks very much for sharing your insights. Well, he loved poetry and uh, he wrote a book, which I wish I could actually publish at some point, which he called a brief poetical autobiography, which was a, an unusual sort of concept. I mean, he told his life story but by he did it by talking about the poetry that he wrote at different periods mm. of his life and um uh, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a great book i mean it's very how much of interest it would be to the general reader i don't know but he it, but uh 
but it certainly was a central part of his life of which I was totally unaware mm. until after he died. It was not something that we knew about around the house at all, or I did. And afterwards I discovered that he was, this was an absolute central part of his life. He was writing poetry and reading poetry and, and working in poetic forms and all of that. Well, that sounds like a viewless wings press uh, publishing discussion. If we have the rights and the ability to do so, that would be pretty cool. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, it's. Uh, I think you have a copy, so you can look at it and see if it's. Uh, if you don't have one, you should. Have I it think I need one. one. I. I. Now we're now we're talking like father and son in the middle of our podcast, but I, we will talk. We will we, on an offline in a minute here. We will talk more about that. But uh, uh, stay tuned after the break, and you will hear a, a little tidbit teaser maybe it's an upcoming book teaser uh, from my grandfather's poetic works well thanks again dad you're welcome pleasure we're back i'm going to close this episode by reading a piece that my grandfather albert h moorhead wrote back in 1931 albert h moorhead was a renowned author and editor and card player and he wrote some wonderful poetry so I'm going to read the context for this poem that he wrote and the poem itself. There's my grandfather, Albert H. Moorhead. By rights, the sestina, or sextane, as the early English experimenters called it, is not rhymed. An equivalent purpose is served by repetition of the terminal words of the verses. Later English poets rhymed their sestinas, so I thought I would to go to them one better and supply interior rhymes. So far as I knew, nobody had done that. The Sestina that follows is one of the few poems that I can locate exactly in all coordinates of date, place, and elapsed time. Southwick and I, having had an over-heavy dinner at Kavanaugh's with clam bisque and hung quail, staggered back to his room at the New Yorker. I propose that we write matching Sestinas, mine on loving rain, his on raining love. We adopted the terminal words and the interior rhymes for each stanza. We set to at about 10 o'clock and finished shortly after midnight. It would have been earlier, but when Southwick learned that my acrostic was in my tornado, the three-line summation at the end, he rewrote his tornado to include his own initials, and that took an extra three minutes. We did spend two more hours howling over each other's efforts and annotating them. We wrote on the backs of, of New Yorker letterheads, and I have the originals. Loving Rain There is music so great in the sound of the rain, beating time on the slate of my roof as I write. Though its thrills penetrate through my flesh to the lane of my veins and elate me, its rhythmical might makes me feel that my fate and the visions I've seen in the rain indicate what the future may mean. Much the fairies disclose. Can I tell what they mean from the water that flows, from the mists and the rain, from the glistening snows? Many secrets I've seen where the rainwater glows. There the elves often write secret legends in prose. Ah, if only I might read the writing that shows in the mud-puddled lane. Many nights I have spent ill at ease. I have lain on my bed, discontent and with worrisome mien, feeling captured and pent, lacking strength, lacking might, while the rain clouds were rent and were pouring forth rain. Had I followed my bent, I'd have rushed to the scene of the rain for absenting myself was not right. And when skies are soft and blue and the stars hold their right, shining bright through and through in the infinite lane of the heavens, though true be the thought that the scene is enchanted, though new and divine be the mien of the moon, where in lieu of the sun she may reign, all I think of is due, though there be but a might. Potent oracle, tell me one thing if you might. Is there water in hell? If there's not, is it right to deprive men as well of the glorious rain? 
even damned folk who fell from God's grace and have lain through the years in a cell in his dungeon so mean should be bastard. I yell for this merciful scene. Ah, the rain's gentle tone seems to die, and I've seen nothing yet. I must own, though I've studied with might for a sign on a stone of the hail that might mean something mystic. I groan as I sit here and write, for I'm left all alone and gaze down the lane still in ignorance. Flown is my dream with the rain, and my hopes like the rain can no longer be seen. Have they passed down the lane as a rivulet might? Melancholy, I write, and with tempest racked mean. Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast is written and produced by James Moorhead. You can follow me on Twitter at Dublin Ranch, subscribe to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, and follow us on viewlesswings.com or on Instagram at viewlesswings.com.